Hello, yes, that's right. I haven't even started, we're clapping. That's exactly what we needed. Um, thank you so much for the next panel. My name is Manu Meal. I uh, am a board member of American Promise, and I help lead an amazing organization of amazing young people called Bridge USA. It's the largest and fastest growing multi-partisan movement of young people trying to solve our differences. And we've got amazing leaders right there. So let's, let's give it a, how's it going? Um, but most importantly, because we're short on time, I want to get us right to the panel. The way that we're going to structure this conversation, um, I think I don't think any of our panelists need introductions, but uh, I'm going to just give you some context and structure it accordingly. Uh, the first is Mindy Finn, um, who is a veteran political operative with major roles for three presidential campaigns. She ran for office in 2016. She's the CEO of Citizen Data. Um, Mindy's going to give a presentation uh, for about five minutes about um, what people are thinking in this country? What is the data saying? And then, uh, it's not much of a surprise, but we're gonna have a conversation with two other amazing guests, Mindy and myself. So, let's get it started. Mindy Finn, can we, can we, can we have you on the stage? Let's welcome Mindy. Thank you, Manu. So let's see if this is gonna work, all right. Um, so it's great to be with you all. Uh, as was said, I am Mindy Finn. I'm currently the CEO of Citizen Data. Um, have done many other things in the democracy world to improve civic engagement, representation, create a healthier democracy. Um, just a quick note to what is Citizen Data. We empower change makers with the actionable data and tools to transcend differences, improve lives, and drive real impact for a stronger, more responsive democracy. Uh, we're building a platform, so we do a lot of research, but this is really a platform for the long term with a big ecosystem of partners who benefit from uh, open access to analytics, message guidance strategy, and we've worked with many organizations that um, have unique and distinct missions, but are all really working to, to better democracy, including American Promise and many others who are working on uh, anti-corruption reforms, institutional political reforms, um, building up kind of multi-party strategy and the like. So I'm just gonna talk through at a very high level a few data points to just set the stage for this conversation, kind of in, in three parts. So first, looking at the challenges that are facing us in democracy today, the opportunities, and then how we can really build some momentum here in the ways that American Promise is doing. So first of all, um, you know, the threat. So there's a lot of things we could cover in threats, but on topic with this conference, when, you know, we do a lot of research on the American public and in, you know, a recent study, recent survey, um, you know, 41% rank the influence of money in politics as an extreme threat to democracy. In survey after survey, we have 70 something percent, 80% who think it's a big problem and a big issue, but 41% ranking it an extreme issue. Um, in terms of representation, and this really impacts representation, ultimately, you know, that Americans are not broadly feeling represented. Uh, it's really split. 43% feel represented by their democracy, while 42% do not. And I won't tick through every category, but in general, um, it's those who have traditionally not necessarily had the power in the system who feel the least represented. Through this. We're having a crisis of election trust. Um, this is something that has been building over time, um, certainly for the last 20 years since the election, since the 2000 election, but it has a particular acute issue now. Um, it's not, you know, it wasn't necessarily perpetuated. People aren't necessarily tying it to the money issue, but people do cite the money issue and corruption as part of why they don't trust the system. Um, you know, in 2020, we had 43% of Americans who either deny the results of that or have some doubts. And as they're looking to 2024, it actually goes well beyond that and crosses parties where there's just a lot of distrust in the system. So looking at this, this is specific to some work that American Promise has done in Pennsylvania. Um, and I kind of gave this away a little bit before that 75% of Pennsylvanians agree that those who give a lot of money to elected officials have more influence than others. So that's, you know, we often say there's good news and bad news. Uh, give you the bad news first. Um, so that's what I did. But now we'll move to some of the key uh, opportunities. So opportunities in front of us, there is really an opportunity to educate. Um, without going into just throwing some more numbers at you, we have looked at a lot of different ways of talking to uh, various voters in states 
about the, uh, the policies and the, specifically the constitutional amendment that American Promise is advocating for to enact stronger limits on political contributions and spending. Um, and once voters have the facts about this policy change to fight big money in politics, they are much more likely to support it. Um, Americans want to defend their communities from outside influence. Uh, for Pennsylvanians, the strongest bipartisan consensus is for regulation of out-of-state money. Um, when we look across a whole range of different reforms, and this is supported by 68% of Republicans, 69% of Republican-leaning independents and nonpartisan independents, and 74% of Democrats and Democratic leaners. And this is important because um, this is really an issue that crosses parties, and I know you've talked about this here. Um, the other thing, just to kind of note, um, is you know one thing that we've done is we really like to segment and look at the American public to truly understand who are those who are already convinced um, on these kinds of issues? Who are those that are really inhibiting movement and progress? And who are those that are in the middle? We call those that you know, are truly um, advocates for reform of all kinds, defenders, democracy defenders, those that are trying to oppose it, democracy inhibitors, and those in the middle, democracy shifters, which is who we've really worked with American Promise on looking to educate and persuade. They are people who at their core share a lot of democratic values of wanting greater representation, more accountability, um, et cetera, but they're very confused and kind of, you know, really are vulnerable to the current um, polarized environment that we're in. So just finally, why I think this is a real opportune moment in terms of mobilization, we see a very activated electorate. Uh, for the last two elections, we have voter turnout being incredibly high, even when predictions were that it would not be as high, such as you know during COVID, for example. And this is true on both sides, and current issues are really igniting that kind of reform. Um, also, um, you know, we see primary turnout in this election particularly high, so really what this tells us, you know, there is a risk in this. An activated electorate is a good thing, but if it's just perpetuating polarization, perpetuating um, the nihilism around, you know, the role of money in politics, that in itself is not enough. It's not just enough to get more voters registered and more voters turned out, which is kind of the core message. Um, across party lines, voters are ready to pursue reforms that limit money in politics, as, I, as I've been mentioning. With that, go to the panel. Well, thank you so much, Mindy. But, um, um, I, I, I purposefully not said anything about myself because you'll hear from me from dinner and this conversation is much more valuable to all of our time. So with that, uh, I want to welcome on stage to compliment uh, Mindy's presentation. Uh, first, the president of American Promise, Jeff Clements. Uh, if, I don't know at this point who doesn't know Jeff, so uh, that's my introduction for Jeff. Um, and second, I want to welcome Andrew Yang, uh, presidential candidate of 2020 and uh, co-founder and CEO of the Forward Party. So let's just get right into the conversation. Thank you, Mindy, for that data and that assessment of our current political system. Um, I want to first ask, ask Jeff, um, you know, as a younger person, I'm 23, I graduated in 2020, we've got some young people in the audience. Uh, I wanna ask you, how did we get here? How did we get to this political moment and how do you think an organization like American Promise uh, is, is necessary at this moment? Yeah. Well, thanks, Manu. Um, one um, sh very short answer to how we got here is, um, I'm being a little facetious, but Manu came to our 2019 National Citizen Leadership Conference. Uh, so I'm going to just say that as a thank you to Manu for what he's doing. He's a young man now. That was three years ago. And he not only came here, he was running an organization called Bridge USA and brought about 40 or 50 college students with him to the National Citizen Leadership Conference of 2019. And he's now on our board. Um, so huge shout out and thanks to Manu Meal. Um, who I I made a big donation to American Promise behind the curtains. Thank you, Jeff. You know I don't need to say. Thank you, thank you. He doesn't do that because uh, he's, he's hustling to raise money for Bridge USA too. So um, we're very proud to have him on our board at uh, American Promise. And it gives, I think, all of us uh, uh, a lot of faith about the future of this country if we can do this work. 
Uh, I want to thank Andrew Yang for being here today, too, and, and Mindy. Uh, we've worked closely with Mindy and Citizen Data. So just thanks to, to, to these folks. Um, and, and I'm going to take the question as serious as it is. How we got here is really important, I think, to wrestle with, because if we don't wreck and write about how we got here, we won't make the right decisions about how we get out of here, um, assuming the here is a state of affairs that isn't serving the people of the United States or the, or the planet. Um, and for me, I, the reason I was so excited about this panel is the, the, the people up here, I think, have done a lot of thought about what exactly is going on in this country right now and in this world, and how can we make the right choices? You know, Andrew Yang was a very, came very close to <coughs> shaking up the entire presidential race in 2020, after never having run in the Democratic Party, he competed in seven debates and was a force in that. And yet, well, it's, yeah, yeah. And yet he's thought hard about what, you know, is that the path to just keep doing that again? Uh, or is there something bigger going on that calls for things No, I do like, love Iowa. <laughs> you know? And, and so I think there's something yeah. bigger going on. And, and we are in an era where we're going to see new parties. We are in an era where Mindy Finn does not take her data and intel and mm -hmm. just work for the parties and try to just, there's, the, the, the system is broken. People have said that a lot. But very fewer people than that have actually <coughs> tried to figure out, okay, if the system's broken, what's the next system? And so how we got here, from my point of view, is probably a 50-year journey. I was, you know, in the legal breakout, and just the breakouts we just had, and Brian Boyle, our senior counsel, he pulled it up with Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976, and then Bilotti versus, uh, you know, um, uh, Bank of Boston, and I was 78, and it, this has been a long journey, and then from 9-11 to 2008 crash, where the American people have kept seeing um, a shrinking of the voice and ability of the voice of the people and a failure of our responsiveness of government. And you saw it with the Tea Party. Some of us are old enough to remember Ross Perot and the Reform Party. Um, our friend, Senator Jim Rubens, came into politics with that outside reform energy. So we've been through this cycle a few times, and it's getting both better because of what's going on in rooms like this, and worse because of what's going on with insurrections and things like that. But that's part of the same phenomenon, I think, of how we got here. Um, Colonel Wilkerson said this morning, a, a era when, and he took responsibility, but he says we all should, where we kind of went to sleep. You know, we took it for granted. The citizenry went to sleep. The Supreme Court did not go to sleep. They, they rewrote the Constitution while we weren't looking, and now, uh, you know, all the money in the world can come into our elections. Nobody thought that was free speech, but we weren't there. And so I think that's how we got here. And, it, it, you so, know, like most problems, it's harder to get out of the longer it goes. But I think now we're at the place where we can get out. So let me, let me turn this over to you, Andrew, and then I'd love some, uh, some context from Mindy on, on some of the data. So Andrew, how did we get here? What is your assessment, uh, especially roaming the cornfields of Iowa, as you said? Uh, I agree with Jeff in that this has been building up for decades. And the best news I can report from not just the cornfields of, of Iowa, but communities around the country, is that most Americans want the same things. Uh, they're fed up, they're frustrated, and they're trying to figure out what the heck they can do to make things better. Uh, unfortunately, they're being given very, very powerful paths as to what they can do uh, that end up uh, turning people against each other, saying uh, these other folks are to blame, ginning them into tribes that enjoy ideological warfare, separating them into different media universes. And unfortunately, with the internet now, we're talking about uh, hundreds or thousands uh, of uh, little information silos. So there's a lot of confusion that's channeling the frustration and energy into very unproductive ways. And I think our challenge is to try and bring it towards some very, very real concrete things that will improve matters, like what American Promises is undertaking. I think a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United is something that most people agree, um, or most people believe is uh, fanciful, or you know, like, oh, it's impossible to amend the Constitution. 
Um, but I think that we're actually overdue for not just one constitutional amendment, but several. There was a comedian who said that if the Founding Fathers woke up, they'd be like, you guys haven't written anything new <laughs> like, like this whole time? I mean, like it was meant to be a living document. And like I have a very, very high regard for the Founding Fathers, who by the way, were not fans of political parties. <laughs> and so the, 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 uh, the challenge for us is to try and dispel the confusion while though being mindful that there are billion dollar organizations that benefit from the polarization, from the animus, uh, from the emotional cues uh, and, and triggers. Um, really quickly, I just wanna ask a quick follow-up to that. Um, it seems like we're all doing fanciful, bold things. Uh, you recently started a third party. Um, could you expound a little bit on why you think there's a unique moment for trying new things, like a constitutional amendment, um, like a third party, uh, like starting a movement of young people that are trying to bridge differences. What, what's your perspective? Yeah, Love Bridge USA. And what your story, Jeff, made me think, huh, I guess if I brought some, some young people with me, maybe I'd be on your board. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, uh, Let's, we can talk, Andrew. Yeah, so, so, the, uh, so one of the fundamental insights I got from the last number of years is that people want to belong, people want a tribe to join. And at this point, what people imagine to be their policy viewpoints are actually really a result of, in many cases, like a media cultivated tribe rather than how that policy would actually impact their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and so in that landscape, there are two major learnings. Number one, if you wanna grow a movement, then you need to create a tribe for people to join because we are tribal. Even people who don't like tribalism are tribal. You know what I mean? We're like a, a tribe of the, let's say, a little bit more reasonable <laughs> or le less prone to emotional appeals. It, it's pretty funny. Um, so th this tribal of the less tribalized, um, but also that America needs more than two tribes ASAP because if you have two tribes, and by the way, at this point, almost half of Democrats regard Republicans as morally corrupt and a threat to the country. And the same percentage of Republicans feel, feel that about Democrats, and that's going to get worse, not better. So in that environment, you need to have more tribes. My goal is right now, the Ford Party, and I'm, I'm happy to say I just came from a gathering of 1,000 fed up Americans in Houston, Texas, and so the, the tribe is very real and, and growing. Um, but I will say to you all that I don't think three is the optimal number of tribes or parties in this country. I, th I think you'd probably benefit from four, five, six, uh, seven. And, and in that landscape, I think the ideological temperature would be lower. Certainly the, there'd be uh, a more nuanced conversation because it's harder just to demonize uh, another side if there are multiple sides. So I want to turn this over to, to Mindy because I think, I mean, you took me to class with that, with that slideshow about the value and importance of understanding what are Americans thinking. There seem to be two themes, Mindy, that came out of that. One is that everyone seems to be relatively dissatisfied and, and apathetic, but that there's also solutions like uh, money out of politics that most people are interested in getting behind. Could you talk a little bit more about what you found um, polling and analyzing data about where Americans stand on some of these really bold ideas? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you're, you're right. So first of all, just kind of by way of background, I don't know if everyone knows this. So I, I worked within the Republican Party kind of at all levels for 15 years and I've worked in tech companies. So I've seen the breaking of the system firsthand. Um, I like to think I was one of the good guys who was not breaking it, but I still feel like I'm gonna spend the rest of my career making sure my obituary gets it correct, you know, that there's things to overwrite the time that I spent in those places. But um, now in our research, um, you know, we see, yes, like there is wide, it can be really heartbreaking. You know, both you see the results from quantitative research, you're in focus groups, you're, you know, meeting with people in, in real life, and I don't have to tell this room that people feel really disillusioned, um, and they feel disgusted that they're not being served, um, that, you know, we're in a country of incredibly creative people with so much ingenuity, with so much financial success, and yet here we are with a, a system that is so incredibly broken and not serving people in the ways that it is supposed to, that our democracy isn't living up to the American promise that they think that it should. Um, and yet there always is a hopeful note. And this is really what we look for with citizen data. How do we identify, yes, shared policy views, um, 
which I can talk about, but also shared values, common threads, connections, and identities. Kind of what Andrew was talking about, you know, people are looking for, part of why they're grabbing onto politics as, as become more of a religion, you know, while they're vulnerable to doing that, is that they're hungering for community and connection, and it's not present enough in their life. And if without the lack of better options, they are kind of hanging with um, communities or tribes that aren't necessarily healthy or serving them in the ways they should. In fact, they're just turning them against the other side. But at the core, while Americans, what we find, are pretty disillusioned with democracy, they're still very hopeful about America and what we stand for, and that we can come together to move beyond and solve the challenges that we have in front of us. And on the policy front, just to get to the punchline, that includes, we hear it all the time when you ask people, because they'll say it's broken and it's divided and you know, all this, um, okay, well, what would you like to have happen? And they say the money. It's the money. They get it. The other thing you hear a lot is term limits. But yep. money and politics and term limits are the things that you always have 80%, you know, between 70 and 80% of every American of all political stripes, you know, racial and ethnic backgrounds, ages, agreeing on. I, I used to get applause for term limits uh, everywhere I went. Diner, yeah. town hall, Democrat, Republican, didn't matter. Yeah, and, I'm, and I, I know this for a fact with, with younger folks, especially in colleges and high schools, that's the case. I want to ask you this, Jeff, building on what Mindy and Andrew just talked about. In our intergenerational uh, conversation, uh, almost everyone said that people say two things about something like a constitutional amendment or something like a third party or something about you know getting people across lines of differences. Either that's a great idea or that's fanciful. Um, how do you tackle that from your perspective leading American promise, and why do you think that this amendment is the most important thing that can get done in our, our, our political moment today? Yeah. Well, you know, as Mindy just said, 80% um, maybe, but just about everybody, the top of their list is the money, right? It's gotta get the money out. Uh, maybe term limits, but that, we, we certainly see that too. Now, Manu just described two possible reactions to actually trying to do it. Um, it is, convenient, I would say, to say, oh, it's fanciful, because then you don't have to do anything, right? But, <laughs> but what if we imagine for a sec, well, we could, let's, you know, oh, is there any other way? You know, is the Supreme Court going to fix its mistakes and say that we are allowed to regulate super PACs or stop the foreign money coming in? That's no. a strategy, but I'd say it's, yeah, yeah no. it's a failed strategy. It's not going to work. Um, some people tried that. I remember talking to people when we launched American Promise. They said, oh, that's crazy. We're going to elect Hillary Clinton and get the fifth justice, and we're going to overturn Citizens United. And I said, good luck with that. And we kept going. Um, this is a better strategy. If, you have, if anyone has a better strategy, we're all ears. Mm -hmm. um, right? But if it's true that the, the problem is massive concentrated power, economic power, and it's a global phenomenon, and it's concentrating to the great detriment of many democracies, we have handicapped ourselves in responding to those, you know, a lot of forces behind that. We've handicapped ourselves constitutionally from dealing with it. it Europe hasn't, Australia hasn't, other countries do not allow unregulated money like this. And we have basically allowed the constitution to be tweaked with a, it's sort of tweaked, and it sounds like a small word, but it's like DNA tweak. It causes systemic impact. So if the Constitution means that wealthy billionaires, corporations, foreign governments, the biggest unions all have a right to spend whatever they want, we can't fix this. So what's fanciful is thinking that we're going to do anything about the money, um, and that if we don't do anything about the money, things are going to turn out OK. No, that's fanciful. So if it's true that the amendment must be done, then we have to figure out how to do it. American Promise has figured out how to do it. And so that's what we say. And then we see things like this room all over the country. So we offer an invitation. We don't, we don't care who you vote for. Um, we don't care where you come from. Um, we, you are an American Promise member. If you want to say, well, it may be hard, but let's let's figure it out together and join the journey. That's, so, that's how we do it. So just, I, I would, the question that I'm going to go to is, I would love for you to address the biggest critique against the amendment. Um, what is the biggest, what, what is the biggest criticism against this work? And why you think that that uh, criticism doesn't apply? Especially as a lot of the members are going to be going to the Hill tomorrow. 
Yeah, well, you know, I, I think we're talking about it. I mean, it is, it is less a criticism. Most people will either say, great, where do I sign? Or they'll say, oh, great, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, which are two very different responses. But they're both great. So almost oh, wait, nobody... Wait, 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 let me try one. Well, I, I really hope you succeed. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. That's, that's, a, that's another one. And I say, well, come on along and we will. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But, but what we almost never hear is, oh, I'm worried about free speech. Or I'm worried about, you know... What's, what might happen. So there, there's no longer much of a serious debate about whether this constitutional amendment is a good idea constitutionally mm -hmm. or otherwise. It's just the, pe people question the pathway and yeah, the feasibility. The, the biggest critique, sure. if you want to call that, is, oh, it, it, it can't be done. Um, but, or it's too hard. Or, um, or there's a misunderstanding about how amendments happen, and they worry about a convention, which is not our strategy. It's not... That's not a non-issue, but that doesn't come up that much. Mostly it's like, oh, yeah. that's hard. And, and so I challenge, well, frankly, let me just cha throw a challenge out there, because there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of reforms, and many of our beloved co-sponsors here today are focused on them. Um, you know, there's ranked choice voting, there's open primaries, there's all, and that's wonderful. There's all kinds of energy happening. Um, we support that. Um, my, my challenge is, um, you know, Ten years ago, five years ago, if you heard this ranked choice voting idea, you said, oh, good luck with that. Okay, well, that sounds crazy. I'm going I'm to tell you a story about And now about, it's here. This. So. Was, uh, so I was on a call with some ranked choice voting advocates uh, a year and a half, two years ago, and I said, who's the most prominent uh, champion for ranked choice voting? And they said, probably you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, then I, and then I was like, I had a number of reactions. But, yeah. So one was like, oh, I really have to do more if it, it's really me. But then but there was part of it also was like, like what? Um, but then one of the reasons why they said that was it's hard for someone from within the system to champion something that might be against their narrow partisan interest in a particular location. And so if you go to, you know, a Democrat or Republican, they, they can't tell you whether they're for <laughs> it uh, or not. And that's how, uh, you know, I wound up um, with that, that particular label. Um, but now ranked choice voting, to, to your point, Jeff, is very much like a, a national discussion point yeah. where people are, are sitting around kitchen tables figuring out how it works. Um, exactly. And I think the same thing's going to happen with the amendment. I want to quickly, I want to quickly shift this over to Mindy because uh, y'all are talking about ranked choice voting uh, gaining more popularity, more interest. How can something like the amendment get there? Um, Mindy, what is the data shown over the past couple of years since you've been working on citizen data about how people's preferences and interests in these reforms may or may not uh, be increasing? Yeah, well, so the environment, the, the market is much more open for any kind of reform um, today mm -hmm. than it was four years ago, you know, even two years ago. Um, there's a growing level of kind of disgust and just kind of intolerance with the status quo. And not just intolerance with the status quo of like, we're going to have a temper tantrum. I mean, there's some of that, you know, in terms of how we vote, but that we need to get real serious about change. And more voters are getting themselves educated, you know, not the majority, but because yeah. people have, you know, lead regular lives or they do regular things, but, um, but more voters are getting more educated where the idea of these reforms is becoming mainstreamed. As Andrew's talking about even with ranked choice voting, people talking about it around the kitchen table. The thing about the constitutional amendment, though, I should say, different than something like ranked choice voting, is there already is popular support in pretty much across the board in the country for it, um, you know, with Democrats slightly more than Republicans, but in some of the data that I shared from Pennsylvania, it's pretty close. Yeah. Um, same number of Republicans supporting it as Democrats in the electorate. Okay. So the electorate isn't really the challenge. The electorate is, is hungry for these kinds of reforms. It's getting elites and, you know, um, and opinion leaders and others really on board. Um, and, you know, the electorate people, like those in this room, have a role to play in that, right? To push yeah. pressure on those key actors. Um, but it's, the electorate's already there. I mean, yes, there's growing support over the last few years and should keep pushing. Um, but this is, it's already a popular report. Andrew? That's why I love the state by state uh, approach. Um, because for an individual state legislature, if their people are behind it, and by the way, you're not, you know, the 38th state, so this is, <laughs> it's re relatively, uh, you know, it seems like more upside than, than downside. Uh, and uh, the, the reason why I think this work is so important is that there's a ton of energy uh, among the Republican electorate that's just simply anti-establishment. 
Like if you go to them and be like, hey, what do you, what do you think about money and politics and these other issues? I mean, they, they want to throw the bums out <laughs> as, Andrew, as much as the, the next. What, what is the establishment? So, so one Everyone, of the, the toughest so things about, about the establishment, Manu, is that uh, a lot of it's the media at this point, where the trusted media among Democrats is 69% have high confidence the media will play it straight. Republicans, that number is 15%. Republicans do not believe anything that, that is being said on their TV screen, that they'll find a YouTuber that says something that they like more, and, and that, that's where they'll head. By the way, among independents, it's 39%. So, uh, so the the that's not good. You know, well, it, well, it, it's it's between you know Republicans yeah. and Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think this particular phenomenon is something that you really have to try and dig in and unpack uh, because people imagine it's symmetrical, where it's like, oh, you have MSNBC on one side and Fox on the other. No, like you you have essentially like an entire half of the country that believes in institutions and that they're being communicated some version of the truth and then half the country that does, does not believe that at all. By the way, 42% of my support in the presidential was non-Democrats, and there were a lot of voters in focus groups that said, if it's not Trump, it's Yang. And by the way, you know, I, I think I disagree with, with Trump on just about everything under the sun, but the thing that they saw about me was that I was not of the establishment, mm -hmm. and that was enough for them, because they knew the establishment would never send the anonymous Asian man who wanted yeah. to <laughs> well. you know, give everyone money. <laughs> you know, that, that wasn't... <laughs> Um, I could take that so many different places. So, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I want to get really candid with this conversation, so thank you for, for that. Um, Jeff, let me ask you this. Um, everyone here said that this stuff is hard. This is difficult. Everyone has talked about, you know, it being tough, and yet we're sitting in a ballroom in the Mayflower in Washington, D.C., listening about and talking about the value of, of this work. What do you tell someone? Like, what do you tell someone when they say, this is difficult. Like, what is your honest answer to them to get them excited, motivated, and engaged? Yeah. How do we do that? Because that seems to be one of our biggest challenges that Mindy's data is showing is the level of apathy. Uh, well, you know, we don't ever see that. Uh, we're in a ballroom in the Mayflower after three years of COVID in which three or four states joined, you know, the dozens before that. So we now have 22 states that have formally uh, called for this constitutional awesome. amendment. Yeah. Um, you know, and we're, we're in a ballroom uh, with a fellow from Eustis, Maine, named uh, right here. I won't name, do name names, but I could. Chris Kerr, I'll name him. Is um, Eustis, Maine? He's running 400 volunteers right now in Maine through a cold, hard winter, uh, including the COVID outbreak, where they got 70,000 signatures and they're on their way to the ballot in 2023 on this amendment. So, yeah, that's a, that's real. So. Um, you know, and we've got we've got the Massachusetts Citizen Commission here that had a thousand volunteers. Um, I remember when we started, uh, you know, six ballot initiatives we've done at American Promise, um, and we've never lost, not a single one. Uh, Massachusetts that created the Citizen Commission. I'm seeing Representative Gentile and Novell Alexander, some of the commission members. Um, I remember a consultant um, saying, oh, Massachusetts, price of admission, $9 million for the ballot. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I thought it was the citizens initiative. Um, we're going to try it with citizens. We had 1,000 volunteers. Uh, they collected over 100,000 signatures. Mm -hmm. And we won the ballot with 74%, endorsed by Republican Charlie Baker and Senator Elizabeth Warren, Democrat, and everybody in between. So I don't buy that there's apathy. Every time we go out, when we're yep. at farmer's markets, it, it could be snowing. I remember a, a Trump voter had the hat in Lewiston, Maine. Um, I was at the farmer's market collecting signatures. Chris, I'm glad to know I was out there. Uh, and uh, she said, what are you doing? And I said, um, my wife's from Maine. I, I'm not making fun of that accent. I love that accent. Uh, what are you doing? And I said, we're collecting signatures to kick the billionaires out of our election. She said, get over here. <laughs> and she wanted to sign so badly. And that's what we find when we're not in the Mayflower Ballroom. Um, there's a lot of people in this room who can tell you those stories, including Chris. So um, that's, what I, that's what I say to the people who say, you know, oh, that can't be done. Well, 
grab a clipboard and go talk to your fellow citizens. Your, your mind about what this country's capable of and what your fellow citizens are capable of will be transformed in four hours at the farmer's market. Don't believe me, call Chris, get to, he'll put you to work in Maine. Get involved, there you go. I, I wanna, I've, I've, won, I've, been, I've been given the five minute warning, so this is not my fault, I'm not purposely rushing this, but I, I wanna ask, uh, I've got one question for Mindy and then I've got one final question for, for everyone. M Mindy, uh, on this question of apathy, from your perspective on the data, how sticky do you think that apathy is? Do you think that once folks have reported a certain level of apathy, do you think that they're likely to sort of stay permanently disengaged, or do you think that there's ways to, to pull them back? Because that seems to be happening across the country, this apathy situation that Jeff is describing. Yeah, so I mean, first, just to sort of clarify, and building on what Jeff says, you know, there's, I don't know that I would actually call, classify it as apathy. It is sort of discuss disillusionment, but what we're finding is that's becoming a motivator for people to roll up their sleeves and to participate. Um, and to the extent that it's not yet a motivator, you gotta give them the thing to that get engaged where they feel like that their action is actually going to make a difference. I think that's one of the things. You know, right now, they're really just given a ton of, you know, television ads and YouTube ads. Um, on nonstop, you know, play in, ahead of an election, and then they're not engaged with. Generally, that's their experience. So it's really just about giving them something to do and a pathway to make a difference, which obviously American promises. And a tribe to join. And a, and a, and a tribe to join. Um, and so, and people who are like them, like that are in the tribe. You know, yeah. even if they might have disagreements on policy, they're aligned around some kind of reform or some kind of experience, or just frankly aligned well, around nice their people. change. Yeah, they're nice yeah. people. And that, um, yeah. So that's right. And so it's to my in my view just from everything we say, I, it's, it's, not, it's not sticky at all. I mean, this is a country that is incredibly altruistic, incredibly generous, that comes together uh, to deal with crises when we need to, whether it's natu natural disasters or something else. And right now our democracy is the biggest crisis that we have, and I'm confident that we can get them to come together for that too. Thank you for that, Mindy. I think I've got one last question uh, for everyone. This is actually a question that I've asked each of you individually at different points in your career, but you might not remember. I do. Um, uh, which is, what gives you hope? What keeps you going? Uh, despite all of the challenges, all of the, the, if we put it candidly, crap that people face doing this work, what gives you hope? Andrew, do you want to kick us off on that? And we'll, we'll just go. Well, well I'll tell you. Uh, when I was running for president, I said that I had two jobs, one run for president and two stay married. Um, so, <laughs> and I, you know, I was two for two. So when you ask what gives me hope, it's like as long as my wife and kids uh, are strong and healthy and uh, happy to see me, then you know, I, I can do what I do. Uh, as a numbers guy, what gives me a lot of hope and energy is you do not need 51% of the American population to make all of the changes that we're talking about. What percentage do you think we all need? According to the research, you need about 3.5% of the country to get behind these things and they will happen. And the fact is, most of them want what we are providing. They want an answer, they want a solution, they want to belong to something that's positive. There's this massive void that we can help address and if we do it powerfully uh, and genuinely, we're, we can turn this thing around. I mean, how many US senators does it take to control the agenda now? One, you know, you don't need 51 senators. And there's a chance that there could be an independent senator named Evan McMullen getting sworn in as early as January. So people say like, oh, it's impossible, these two parties. Like, no, we can actually make these things happen much faster than most anyone imagines because all you need is a buffer or a, a, a pillar or column in the middle of the system and you can swing things really, really quickly. Mindy? Yeah, well, there's a lot of things that give me hope, but I think one, two, two I'll point to. So first of all, uh, what gives me hope is we still live in an incredibly wealthy, healthy country with so much opportunity and freedom ahead of us. And even though there's a lot of barriers and challenges, we are so much better off than many other countries. And frankly, those of us that get to do this work every day, I feel like it's a privilege. So being part of this community, that really feels like a privilege. We mostly, it's changing, don't have to face you know, violence every day or threats of jail time. That's unfortunately an increasing threat, but, um, but mostly, you know, we're able to operate freely. This, the second thing um, that gives me hope is that 
it might only take kind of 3.5% or you know, one, one senator, but actually the majority of Americans agree on a whole lot. And the majority of Americans are getting more civically, you know, we, we do have a lot of civic engagement. And so that is a huge number of people that can potentially be mobilized to throw their political power and weight around to create the change that we need to see in oh, the country. Let, let me say, I think 75% can agree, but we just need 3.5% to actually take action. Get, right, get right, up, right, right, like, right. Do the thing, you know what I mean? What gives me hope? Um, I want to pick up on a couple of things um, that Mindy said and, and Andrew said before me. And, and um, I think the more you get out around this country, the more you see that those things are true, actually. That Americans are amazing people. Um, you get above the sort of everyday horror show that our politics are and actually start talking to people where they live. It, it's incredible. And, so, you know, so, and we've seen that. And we, but by the way, maybe I didn't, maybe it was obvious, but we didn't pay $9 million for a ballot initiative. We haven't paid $1 million for all six of those ballot initiatives. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, if you add them made all up, they don't some add donors it. in this room happy, Jeff. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is, yes. this is a very, le above their weight this class. is a very leveraged investment because <laughs> it's amazing how much we can do with a little money because Americans are hungry. For, I think what they're looking for is authenticity, you know, that, that it's not a BS thing. It, you're not being manipulated. There's such a radar. And what gives me hope is that people actually have given up on the old manipulative kind of politics, and they're looking for authenticity. And if you offer something, which I think all of us are, that's real, yep. that you don't, you don't know the outcome. None of us know where this is going to end. But if you say it's real, come on the journey. What gives me hope is how many people say, sign me up. I'm going to give it a try. And the second thing, if I can have two. As, please, uh, please. As, 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 it, this as, is your show. OK. Yeah, so, <laughs> so the other thing that gives me hope, though, is I'm not just, if you look at, what gives me hope is history. You know, what I started this morning, some of you were here, uh, with that historic slide of the American journey from the beginning. And I saw, saw those kids who, who led the Patriots Day Parade in Concord a couple of years ago, um, honoring the revolution. And these are high school kids today. and. Um, and that story keeps going. And every one of these generations of Americans had sometimes way worse horror shows than we're dealing with. I mean, you want to go through the 20th century of World War I, flu epidemic, depression, followed by World War II and Korea War. You know, these aren't all happy times. Uh, or you go into the 60s when there's you know, cities burning and a president driven from the White House and a corruption scandal in Vietnam. And, and yet we did four constitutional amendments between 1961 and 1971. Four. And think of all the other reforms that happened then. Think of the progressive era, how many reforms. So Andrew said something that's, I think, really important. There, this is not going to happen linearly. This is a tipping point kind of moment in American history. Where I think we're going to, what gives me hope is we're going to look back in 10 years and we're going to see we lived through one of those eras that we, Americans had before where everything seemed, the wheels seemed to be coming off and yet somehow we created all these new th ways of doing things, a constitutional amendment, ranked choice voting, open primaries, the people responded. And I see it happening and it gives me huge hope and the younger generation with the kind of wisdom that Manu has and so many of them give me um, hope too. So. So, well, now, now, now I can blame you on going over time. And this now your staff will. Um, I, I would, I would just, I want to, I want to. This is totally off track, but I want to take thirty seconds and um, just say one positive thing about each of you. I know this stuff sounds squishy, but I think it matters because this work gets hard. Um, when I first uh, met Andrew and we had a conversation, he was one of the most intellectually humble people I've ever met doing this type of uh, engagement. It was very important for us as young people to see. When I first met Mindy, it was actually in 2019, uh, when she was engaged on citizen data and just getting it off the ground. And people said, well, why is this data relevant? And now we see the market for it. And when I first met Jeff, uh, he gave me space and understanding and mentored me through a very rigorous process. As young people that are here today, um, this stuff matters. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for this conversation. Um, and I appreciate your time. Thank right. you. Thank you. Great moderator. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.